I've had a lot of questions about how I set up this shockwave effect for my game. So let's recreate this effect. These instructions are for the universal render pipeline, specifically for those of you using a 2D renderer. And a 2D renderer is what allows you to use 2D lights in your scene. So if that's you, then let's get right to it. We're actually gonna create two different versions of this shader. The first one can be applied directly on top of a sprite so that the shockwave only happens on that particular sprite. And the second one's just gonna be a slight modification that allows us to do it for the full screen. Let's go. Let's start with the sprite version to act as our base. Create a new sprite lit shader graph. And we're going to need our main text sampled out into our base color since this will be applied to a sprite. Now let's go over here and try to figure out how to make this ring shape that we're looking for. And so to do this distortion type of effect, we're basically trying to raise the UVs in the shape of a ring and expand that outwards. So let's start with a UV node. And let's create an exposed vector 2 called ring spawn position, and we'll default this to 0.5 on the x and y because we're working with UV coordinates which range from 0 to 1. So 0.5 is the center. And we're going to subtract the UV from ring spawn position to basically reorient the UVs so that the ring spawn position acts like the origin. Now let's drag that into a length node. You can think of length like magnitude, but you can see if we move the ring spawn position around, it moves that circle around. So far, so good. Next, create an exposed size float, which we'll use to control the size of the influence that the ring has. Give it a default of 0.05 and make it a slider between 0 and 5. Now, we're going to drag this out into an add and a subtract node. And by combining those back into a smooth step node with the length node as our input, this gives us the basis for our ring. It's kind of hard to visualize that right now though, so just temporarily, let's add a time node so that we can see this in action. So if we plug our time node into a fraction node, that's going to smoothly transition this from 0 to 1, or black to white, and then snap it back to 0, and then keep on repeating that. Shader graph becomes a little bit easier to understand, at least for me, once I'm able to understand that really under the hood this is just numbers. So this node, which is just transitioning from 0 to 1, will hook into our add and subtract nodes. It's not quite a ring yet because we need to first invert this smooth step by plugging it into a 1 minus node and then multiplying that with the original smooth step. Awesome, so we finally have our ring. Now if we add another UV node and add that with our ring here, you can see we're almost getting what we want. In fact, let's plug this into our UV input on the sample node and test this out. Create a new sprite and I'm going to use whatever, sure the background here is fine. Then I'll create a new material that uses this shader and apply it to the sprite. And you can see we're kind of getting what we want. It's warping in some way, but it's not really raising the way that we want. To fix that, go back into our shader and go back to our subtract node at the start here, where we said that this is basically acting as the origin. Well, we want to normalize that. And this is a good place to add strength controls as well. So let's create an exposed float called shockwave strength and default it to minus 0.1. If you want it to look raised, it has to be negative. And let's make this a slider between minus 5 and 5. Now let's multiply our strength by our normalize. Let's break the add connection to the sample node here, as well as this multiply to add connection here, because we're going to multiply these two nodes together. And now plug that into this add node, which will add these results on top of our UV, and plug that into our UV input over here. Now that is looking much better. Since we don't need to visualize this within Shader Graph so much anymore, and we don't want this to repeat by itself over and over, let's get rid of these two nodes. Instead, we're going to create one more exposed float called Wave Distance from Center, and make it a slider ranging from minus 0.1 to 1, and let's give it a default of 0.5. We need this to start at minus 0.1 because of the difference in size here. We're defaulting this to 0.05, and since we plug it into an add and subtract node, we get a difference of 0.1 between the two, which means at a value of 0, this will still show a slight distortion on the screen, which you'll see in just a second. Go ahead and plug that into our add and subtract node and save. Now we can control the shockwave ourselves with this slider. But you can see, as we discussed, if we zoom in and we leave this at zero, there's still a slight distortion there. That's why we range this down to minus 0.1. If you change your size, your flat value of the wave distance from center is also going to change. Now let's handle the full screen shock wave. So go ahead and duplicate this shader as well as this test sprite here. 
So first we're gonna add an exposed texture 2D called camera sorting layer texture. And it has to be spelled like this exactly. This works kind of like main text in the sense that there are some built-in functionalities in Unity that look for specific references exactly. So the spelling is really important. You can remove the main text texture over here and replace it with that camera sorting layer texture. So if we go back and create a new material for this shader and apply it to our new full screen shockwave sprite here, it turns it gray. So in order to make use of that new exposed texture that we just created in our shader, we first need to create a new sorting layer. Let's call it camera sorting layer. And make sure that no matter how many layers you might have in your game, that this one is at the bottom, which essentially means that it will be rendered on top of everything else. Now go ahead and actually change the sorting layer on this sprite and you can see that still changes nothing. And that's because we need to tweak something in our 2D renderer settings. If you go to edit project settings, we can click here to find our universal render pipeline asset, click on that, and you can see our 2D renderer data here and click on that to select it. Now you're gonna see a camera sorting layer texture option here, and it's usually set to disabled by default. Well, let's change that to default. And immediately after doing that, you should see that our sprite now shows some stuff from our scene. But this isn't quite what we want either. You can see if I drag this around in the scene, it's basically just a snapshot of our scene put on top of a sprite. And if I play, we get some pretty weird results. What we basically want is for this sprite to show whatever the heck our screen position currently is. So go back to the shader and replace this UV node here with a screen position node. Now, even when we drag it around, it's acting like it's almost like a transparent sprite, but it's not. It's a second copy of everything that's behind it with our shockwave effect overlaid onto the sprite as well. So basically, this is rendering everything twice. Now there's one final problem here, and that's that this is not a perfect circle, and that's because of our screen dimension. I'm playing this at 1920 by 1080, which if you divide those into each other, gives us 1.77777. So our X is being stretched by that amount. So to correct that, let's break the connection here and let's first split these coordinates. This is in color data, but actually the R will act as our X position and the G will act as our Y position. So create a new exposed float called X size ratio and default it to 1.777. And let's multiply that float with the R, or as we said, the X from the split node. And let's add a combined node so we can put the X and Y back together again. And I love shader graph. If you leave this as is, you actually, you get this cool vertical pattern that goes away from each other. It's just, it's a lot of fun to play around in shader graph. Anyways, to get our ring back, you can just plug the G into the G in our combined node here. Now that should appear as a perfect circle if you were using 1920 by 1080 as your screen ratio. If any of you out there know how to do this automatically without having to plug in an exposed screen ratio, let us know down in the comments because I would love to know how to do this in a more automatic and automated way. Now to make sure that we size this properly, let's make sure that our game view is actually full high definition down here because free aspect shows a lot more on the width. Now you can see that resized my camera view window here. So let's make this full screen sprite just a little bit bigger than that. To make this easy for this tutorial, I'm going to make this a child object of my camera. Now, if you want this shockwave to emanate from a certain position in your world, then instead you can turn this into a prefab and spawn it in when you need it at that position. And so long as you have the ring spawn position set to 0.5, it will expand from the center of that point, wherever you spawn it in. Now, if you do it that way, make sure you disable or destroy it after the shockwave effect is done to save resources. But I wanna wrap this up, so I'm just gonna show you how to control this with code really quick. Let's create a shockwave manager script and attach it to our full screen sprite object. First, let's create a float for however long we want it to take this shockwave to expand outwards. We're gonna control this with a coroutine, so add a variable for that, as well as a material, since we'll need that to manipulate our shader values. And finally, let's cache the actual shader property that we wanna change, which is wave distance from center, because calling this over and over again every frame is more expensive. So first, I'm gonna grab a reference to the material on our sprite renderer. I'm gonna set up a method that calls our coroutine, which this is just my personal way that I like calling coroutines. And for the actual shockwave expansion, let's create the actual coroutine. First, we're gonna reset our wave distance from center, and we'll set up two floats. Create a while loop using our shockwave time, iterate our elapsed time, and set the lerped amount variable to be equal to a lerp function that goes from our start position to our end position. 
and now set the actual float value on our material to be equal to that lerped amount. I'm just going to call this coroutine whenever we press the E key on our keyboard to make this easy. And there you go. Very cool. So again, you wouldn't just want to have this sitting there being active all of the time because it's rendering everything twice. If you do want it sitting on your camera, you're going to want to add functionality to actually disable and enable it when you need it. But this is just a simple example. I hope you enjoyed, guys. If you found this video helpful, give it a like, share, subscribe, comment, all those things to let YouTube know that this is a video worth sharing with more people. I hope you have an amazing day. I want to give a very special thank you to our Hall of Fame patrons, Jakob Yandok, Zondra Kessler, Darren Perrine, Throbbing Wind, Fontaine Waite, and Couch, as well as our Early Access patrons, Zioma and Ken Wade. If you choose to support us on Patreon, you can get Early Access to all our videos, monthly alpha builds, and more.